Welcome back to Revival on the Air today. This episode is the final instalment in a series of testimonies that I recorded at our National Youngies Camp in Sydney. In this episode, I talked to Pastor Michael and Liz from Canberra, a married couple who, despite their youthful appearance, don't fall into the young people category, but are very youthful at heart. Their story is remarkable, so much so that I reckon they're descendants of Job from the Old Testament. This world sure has thrown them a lot of stuff to deal with, but I tell you what, God's been there right alongside them every step of the way. Enjoy and God bless. Welcome Pastor Michael and Liz to the podcast. Thank you. Hi. Good to be here. So you live in Canberra? Yeah. Yes. But your testimony didn't start in Canberra. Mine didn't, no. Where did it start? I did most of my growing up in South Australia, Woomera and Wyala. I've always had a belief in God as a child. I always have. And I, I remember my mum would say to me, you have got someone looking over you. This is, I mean, I'm talking like as a three-year-old. She goes, because you should be dead. You know, like on the ship over from England to Australia, because I was born in England. I would be swinging off the handrails out to sea. <laughs> now, you've got that picture of the kind of kid that I was. And my mum always said, someone's looking after you. Mm. And I always had a belief in God. Um, I remember being at home one day and it was a bit overcast. I was actually bored. And mum says, grab a book. And I'm not a big reader, I never have been. I grabbed a children's Bible off the shelf and I opened it up and what I turned to was this old fella, big wide beard, and he had a, a, a quill and he was writing. And I said to mum, what's happening here? And she said, oh, he's receiving the words of the Bible. And I just went, oh, okay. I never thought much of it. Then um, at 15, I finished high school and I started an apprenticeship. So here's this 15-year-old going to the steel mills. You'd get covered in muck and dirt. And then all the guys that were with you, they were all like 18 or 19. And they'd go, we're going to the pub. Do you want to come? Because they saw me just as one of the boys kind of thing, even though I probably was a boy mm. and they were young men. So I found myself at the pubs at an early age. Then I found myself um, involved in doing drugs with them. Back then, when you turned 16, you could get your learner's permit for a bike. And so instead of getting my mum up at 5 o'clock in the morning to take me into work at BHP, I got my bike licence and started riding motorbikes. So I got involved in the bike scene, doing drugs and all of that kind of stuff at 16. Mm. I don't think at that point in time I was really searching for God. I thought I was content with my life. I had a job, I had money, I had a bike, so I had the drugs, I had all of that. And then I think just one day, uh, we were out bush, and we were at this uh, party, and what we were doing is we were just doing what we normally do. There's people passed out, people fighting, people being sick. And I remember sitting on a log near the fire, and I just thought to myself, there has to be more to life than this. This cannot be what life is about. Parties, drugs, mm. bikes, alcohol, and everything else that goes with that. And the funny thing was, you know, as I look back at it, now at that point in time, I felt like I was sitting in a ray of light. I felt like everybody around me was in the dark, but I had this little ray of light on me. And I, I remember that, and I go, well... Anyway, the times are vague, because this is over 30 years ago. In Wyala, this is where all this happened, working for BHP, fortnightly pays. I was at the local shopping plaza mall thing, and um, there was a, a gentleman there. We didn't really get on. You knew him through work? I knew him through drugs, partying, okay. things like that. Different group of people, different crowd, just a bit of animosity between us. So I walked up to him to pick an argument, and there was a group of guys around him. And I heard him mention speaking in tongues. And I just simply asked the question, what's speaking in tongues? And then he informed me of repentance, receiving the Holy Spirit, baptism. He talked about the truth in Christ. He talked about God is real. And um, I walked away. <laughs> I know what happened. You know, the Lord moved on me to not pick an argument with him. Yeah. And I just walked away. I went, oh. So that was on a Thursday, which is a paid day. On the Friday, I was on my bike. The next day, just in the back street of Wyala, I was doing a drug deal. And across the road was a person that I knew. 
and I knew this person to be a drug user. I knew him to be a partier. I knew him to be someone that was uh, a bit of a fighter. That was the kind of person that he was. And I knew him from a, an early age. I used to call his mum and dad, auntie and uncle. Okay. And um, I called him over and I said, do you want to buy? He goes, I've repented. I've been baptised by full immersion and I've received the Holy Spirit and I speak in tongues. And he told me the same mm. as the guy on my Thursday. So that's a Thursday and on the Friday. Wow. On the Saturday, we were sitting in the main street, and I had drugs on me. I had a bottle of whiskey because I was drinking a lot. And uh, these two guys, I didn't know them at all from a bar of soap. I, I just didn't know these guys. They just walked up to me, and they simply said, Do you know Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for you? Well, what are you going to do about it? To my mate, I turned to him and I said, I think someone's trying to tell me something here. I mean, three times in three days. Yeah, that it's was a Thursday, the Friday, the Saturday. And I just went, I think someone's trying to get to me. Someone's trying to tell me something. And, of course, I remembered. It's not as if you declare this to everybody. Well, not then anyway, because you didn't understand it. But I remembered that I called out at that party saying there's got to be more to life yeah. than this. And I remembered that. And so I went, OK, well, I'll find out. I went to the meeting. Uh, I can't remember the talk. Uh, I can't remember anything about the meeting. But what I do remember is they said, well, who wants to get baptised? And I said, yeah, I want to I want to do this. I want to find out. So um, I got baptised in a backyard in Wyala, in a pool, while it was raining. And it only rains average 32 days a year. Yeah. So, But I, I wanted to find out. I had an inquiry in mind. I could never believe in evolution. Even when I was being taught as a person that didn't have any real strong beliefs, I looked at it and went, it can't work. It doesn't make sense. It, it, just, it, no, it just doesn't make sense. Mm. You know, like cold-blooded fish, small changes, warm-blooded mammal, doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work. Um, it seems like forever that I was praying to receive the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't. It was like maybe a week or two, but I went, well, I'm going to find out. And I, I remember going to the prayer line, I go, can I, I'd like to have some prayer to receive the Holy Spirit. The gentleman that was praying with me, he said, okay, no worries. So we started praying and he looked at me and he goes, you have. You've received the Holy Spirit. And um, you know how a lot of people say that they have um, a big flash, a big feeling, they get all of this kind of sensation. Well, to me it was like, oh, have I? Because I couldn't hear myself. So you were praying in tongues, but you didn't realise. I didn't realise I was doing it. I thought okay. I was still saying hallelujah. Yeah, okay. And it wasn't until he said, no, no, you're not saying hallelujah. And I went, oh, okay. So then I sat down and I just couldn't stop smiling for a start, which is usually a dead giveaway. You know? um, I went home and I had some prayer by myself. And yeah, it was just in the spirit. Wow. So if anyone says to me, when did you receive the Holy Spirit? I couldn't honestly answer them. Sometime around that day. Sometime around that day, yeah, <laughs> and that's the truth, that is. Because, you know, it was like every day, you know, having times of prayer just to receive. Mm. And far as I know, I was always saying hallelujah. Yeah. Okay. And I may not have been. Yeah. What happened to your life after that? Well, the, the drug addiction went straight away. The alcohol abuse went straight away. Um, the cigarettes probably took a while after what did, that. What did you think when those desires disappeared? To be honest, I didn't think about it. It was just, yeah. I've been at the meeting on Sunday, received the Holy Spirit, and um, I'm sitting at home, and there's a knock on the door, and there's this guy that does drugs, and the first words out of my mouth were, I don't do drugs anymore, God's healed me. And I didn't even think about that, that came straight out. <laughs> this guy, phew, shot, gone, bang, he was out there, yeah. didn't hang around. I suppose it was just that simple declaration, mm. and from that moment on, it was gone. gone. I've never had the... The real decider to do them anymore just went. That's amazing. Yeah. So I want to get into a healing testimony that you've got, but before we do that, I want to hear Liz's testimony about how she came mm. to the Lord. Well, I can remember, I came to the Lord in 1979. Sorry, I can remember as a young girl looking out my bedroom window, looking up at the stars and thinking, I always had a belief that God was out there, but I, I wondered how I could have a relationship with him. Uh, I was attending Catholic Church with my mum and my brothers at this stage, and I was going through my confirmation. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad never gave me the idea that he was God-fearing or anything. 
like that. Uh, I grew up in a very violent home. Anyhow, my dad actually had overheard another gentleman witnessing to somebody else. And so, of course, my dad wanted to know, and hence he came along and he was disappearing for two to three hours and, you know, going to the Catholic Church, you know, 45 minutes, you're done, dusted, and you're out of there. And So he was going to he was our going church to, meeting yeah, on a Sunday, yeah, not to the Sunday and not telling us. <laughs> and because um, generally Sunday was kind of like his day, yeah. you know, in the morning, and he would pack us all off, send us off, and we would walk down to the Catholic Church and then come back and... Um, but he is actually coming back smiling and very happy. And my mum was like, mum and dad were actually arguing over him smiling. And he's like, I'm not. And mum's like, well, you are. You know, it was a bit silly. But, but anyhow, he never said where he was going or what he was doing. And we never thought church. Never, ever. He was just, like, it blew me away that he was actually searching for God. Yeah, right. Um, anyhow, so he said, if you want to know what I'm doing... You can come along and find out for yourself. So, of course, we all went. And I went to Sunday school and I was told that I could have this personal experience with God and how I'd know is I would speak in tongues. And I was like, I'd never heard that before. So I was actually really quite confused with the message that I'd been hearing from the Catholic Church. As part of, as the part confirmation, of yeah, process. confirmation process. Mm. Like I'd heard of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, yep. but I hadn't heard that how you would know you'd receive the Holy Spirit is you would speak in tongues. And I was shown in the Bible where I wasn't in the Catholic Church. There was there was none of that. And, and I can remember saying, well, I thought that was just for the apostles. And I was told, no, 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 it's relevant, just as it was back then mm. for you today. And you can have this experience yourself. And you'll know because you'll speak in tongues. And I was like, oh, okay. And so a little while later, um, I saw my mum get baptised and um, she came up out of the waters speaking in tongues. Um, yeah, and I, I received would have been early July 1979 and got baptised by full immersion and had really believed that everything would be honky-dory in my household. thought we'd be exempt from all problems in life, but, yeah, no. As, <laughs> it just as, was not the case. <laughs> as we read in the scriptures, it yeah. remains on the just and on the unjust, yeah. right? Yeah. But what I saw was... I guess a huge change in my dad. My dad really was, was just an amazing turnaround from how the Lord really worked in his life. He, I mean, my dad went to Vietnam and come back and was very, um, very violent. Um, we had holes in our walls and yeah. stuff like that, so it wasn't really good. But just seeing the Lord work in my dad through the Holy Spirit, you know, or alcohol. My dad was smoking eight packets of cigarettes a day. Eight packets. Yeah. And I saw um, my brother was riddled with cancer and we'd had prayer and we actually had prayer, sent the prayer um, request out for all of Australia. Yep. And all of Australia was praying for my brother and um, when they went to do the surgery, they had found that all of his cancer had actually come up into the middle of his chest. So they, it was like a, a sausage. And so they were actually able to remove that. So from being riddled, it was all through his body, the cancer had, through prayer, had all come into one spot where the surgeons were able to actually get it. He has a massive scar, but they were able to to do that. And my younger brother died, and my mum prayed for him, and she spoke in tongues, and he came back to life. There's nothing wrong with him. Um, and myself, as I walked on, I got married at a very early age. I got married at 16. Uh, and I had my first son and my marriage fell apart and I was like devastated. How old were you when your marriage fell apart? Uh, 18. Mm-hmm. So I hadn't been married very long. Mm-hmm. And after Joel was eight weeks old, I fell down a 13 concrete steps stairwell. First miracle is, is I didn't actually, you know, your natural response is, as you're falling down the steps, is to put your hands out yeah. and to protect yourself, to brace yourself. Yeah. Well, I didn't do that. I actually had my arms around Joel, you know, so my arms were crossed over him to mm. protect him. So my back took the brunt. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and I couldn't 
at the bottom of these 13 steps and he was still asleep. Charlie wasn't. So I praise the Lord that I didn't actually throw him up and over in the stairwell because I could have killed him. Mm. So praise the Lord for his life. Mm. Um, But when I landed at the bottom, I couldn't feel anything in my arms and I had winded myself, something chronic, and I had cried out to the Lord in my head and I just said, Lord, whatever I've done, I need you to heal me and I need you to heal me in now. And I felt this heat go from the tip of my head to the tips of my feet. And I knew then whatever permanent damage I had done, God had healed. Mm. So walking, I was walking very gingerly and my shoulders were literally like this. I know you can't see how it's on radio. but um, uh, For the listeners, it's one shoulder's very high, one shoulder's very low. <laughs> yeah. So I had to go and have x-rays and my, my hips were an inch and a half out. Wow. From each other. Spine was going one way, neck was going the other way. And they just they just said they couldn't believe that I was actually up, up and walking around. And I knew that that was the Lord. I still had a lengthy process to go through. They said I couldn't carry Joel because he was a big baby. Mm. Like I had to, as I said, my marriage was not really good. But, you know, having that and then when my marriage broke up, it was just that this relationship that I'd had with God with, you know, from a little girl desiring to have a relationship, receiving the Holy Spirit. That was the beginning of my relationship. And when my marriage really just fell fell apart, it was like, it was really ignited again, this relationship with God. And I knew it was just God and me. Yeah. And that God was going to look after me no matter what was going to happen, you know. And I, as I said earlier, I thought I was going to be exempt from all these problems, you know, to come to know God and everything was going to be honky-dory, but, you know. Life happens, mm. and but we've got the key, which is is the Holy Spirit, and so yeah. So as I've I've walked on, and you know, got divorced, and um, so I had to raise Joel by my by myself, and you know, I really got stuck into the things of the fellowship, and the Lord just really blessed me, and then I met Mike, and um, just before. We got married. Is that a blessing as well? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Lord yeah. continues well, to she, bless she, you. She did cry out for I her really husband. I really cried out. I can't say that part. I'm not just saying. <laughs> yes, you can. No, no, no. It doesn't mean that it's going to be a... No, not <laughs> No, anyhow, the Lord did answer my prayer and, and provided Brilliant. Mike. And just before paying for our honeymoon, we actually found out that Mike was blacklisted. I was a bankrupt. He was bankrupt. Right. And he had no idea. And then two weeks after that, we found out I was riddled with endometriosis. Right. And told, don't hold your breath in ever having children again because... Welcome to married life. You too. Oh, seriously. Yeah, look, it gets better. <laughs> it gets better. Yeah, oh, wait, yeah. there's more. But anyhow, so we got on, on our honeymoon and then um, we came back and Mike was retrenched. And, um, yeah, so he came home and he goes, well, I've been retrenched. I was like... Okay. So how long have you been married at this? A week. <laughs> so be married a week. Married Came a back week. from our honeymoon. So now you're bankrupt. Been just before. Just, just before, before that, the honeymoon, yeah. yes. Retrenched from your job. When yeah. we got back from the honeymoon. Riddle within dream of marriage. Yeah, it was just <laughs> <not> happening. <laughs> and, yeah. But, you know, God is gracious and oh, God amen. was with us. And as I said, I wanted to have children. The thing with endometriosis is you can't fall pregnant. Mm. If you can fall pregnant, that heals. Heals endometriosis. But the trick is falling pregnant. And so anyhow, we went down to, Mike ended up with another job. The Lord blessed him uh, with a job by that Friday. Yeah, by well, that Friday, a couple of days. He, he got another job, so it was good. I think one of, one of the, the wonderful things, though, another part of the testimony is, is we, um, we had nothing in, in the house, like food-wise and stuff, because like you go away f- yeah. on your honeymoon, you make sure you, you run low on, on, on periples, yeah, on that kind of stuff. And I go to work, I'm retrenched. We have like fifty dollars to our name, mm. you know, and so we we went to the um, supermarket. You know, we just asked the Lord to bless our comings in and our goings yeah. out, and we got our groceries and we had change. Yeah. Yeah. Lucky your wedding vows were still fresh in your mind. Oh well, Richer we did we did do a chuckle when health. when we had the <laughs> richer for poorer. We we just with had a bit of a laugh because with all my worldly debts, debts I that's what Mike said. Yeah. So, so anyhow, we went down the coast and. Um, but we'd had um, this prayer and fast 
about wanting a healing for the endometriosis and um because i was due to go in and have a total hysterectomy and um anyhow we had the prayer and fast and i'd read about gideon and, and i thought well i don't have any sheep to put the fleece you know say dew on and dew around the fleece and so we thought well lord i'd like to be pregnant by my birthday or have the papers to go in to hospital anyhow my birthday came and i wasn't pregnant and i was not a happy chappy i was really quite upset and mike was he just had this real peace he's like well you haven't got your papers so you know the lord's going to answer answer our prayer what i think what i said was if you haven't got the one then you've got to have have you got to have the other mm. you know we prayed pregnant on your birthday or in hospital and i said well you're not in hospital so there's only one option and through my little hissy fit just sort of stopped and did a bit of soul searching within myself and thought well there's you know you should just really be happy that you have one child because there are many women that, that don't have any children. And then, you know, maybe the fact that God wants you to go in and speak to somebody in the hospital, they've got to come to know the Lord mm. this way. And I'm, So once I had sort of, you know, pulled myself together and that, I'd come to terms with that. We went down the coast and my folks had just moved down there and anyhow, my dad had had a stomach bug. And on the way back, I started to feel unwell and I thought, oh, don't tell me. I've caught my dad's stomach bug. So two weeks later, my dad turns up at my house and I am still very ill. And my dad goes, oh, you look dreadful. I said, I feel dreadful. I said, how long were you sick for? He goes, oh, 24 hours. I'm like, seriously? (laughs) said, 14 days and I'm still seeing the porcelain bowl. (laughs) And uh, nothing was clicking. Yeah. In my head, and anyhow, so Mike had come home from work, it was after hours, we had to go and see another doctor, and uh, Joel was three and a half at this stage, and he had prayed for me, and he had said that Jesus would heal me. Got into the doctors, and so I'm seeing another doctor, and I have to go through everything that I've just been through with him, and he goes, would you just humour me and do a pregnancy test? And I'm like... Oh, all right, if you insist. Like, I felt like Sarah laughing at God. Surely not. You know, I, even As though... In Sarah and Abraham. Sarah and Sarah, Abraham, Abraham, yep. Abraham, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, yes, Liz, you've been on this prayer and fast. Oh, so spiritual. And a bit like the children of Israel, you know, Lord, you've brought us out of Egypt and yet we're still whinging kind of thing. That's how I felt. But anyhow, I did the pregnancy test and right before my very eyes, it was positive. And I was like, now how... Do I go outside into a waiting room full of people and tell Mike? Now, Mike is very shy, quiet, and retiring. Amen. Not. <laughs> <laughs> Not. And anyhow, so Mike, I get out there and Mike's like, so what's, what's going on? And I'm like, I've got this bug and it's going to last for nine months. <laughs> well, just, he was just uh, elated. I did which my was, little victory dance. Yeah, yeah. which was just so beautiful. And then Joel turns around to me and he goes, I told you, Mum. I told you Jesus would heal you. I love it. The next day in the mail were my papers to go into hospital. And when you work it out on when you fall pregnant, I actually fell pregnant seven days before my birthday. Yeah. But it was too early back then yeah. To, yeah. to pick it all up. So, right. and we had Jade and it's just been a real, a real blessing and, mm. you know, went on to have Brett. And then, yeah, I feel like... Yeah, a bit like Job. Like, we just have a lot. It's tough to go through these things, isn't it? Mm. But we wouldn't be here sharing wonderful testimonies about God's amazing power had those circumstances not fallen upon you. I had a great confidence that it was going to happen. It was just the timing was brilliant. Yeah, God God knew. Tell us about what happened to you. And um, we were uh, just going through life happy as Larry, not a problem, thinking everything's sweet. And then one weekend we went to the farm, which is where Liz's parents live down in Bega. You've got cows and dogs and, you know, it's farm. It's, farm. Yeah, it's, you know, farm. it's, it's, it's farm. It's a working farm. Yeah. yeah. And um, that weekend I went through a whole Ventolin inhaler. And Liz looked at me. I, I didn't sleep for the whole weekend. Had you suffered from asthma? As a kid. Yeah. You, as a kid I did, but this was like really just like... 
oh, you know, horrible. This is bad. And I hadn't, I didn't sleep for the entire weekend. So I had the big black eyes, and I'd gone through a whole ventilant inhaler because I couldn't breathe. And then this goes, okay. When we get back to Canberra, you're going to the doctor. So I went to the, to see the GP, and the GP said, "You've got a serious problem here." And that's when Dr. Bradfield thought, "Yep." Yeah, there's something wrong here. I don't know what it is. It could be food related. So then we had to go off all this food. I was still working, mm. you know. So it was just like processed foods, milk, you know, yeah. all the dairies. It was off all of that kind of yeah. stuff, and, and nothing. Yeah. So we had to do all of that, and then Mike was not improving. Yeah. With doing all of that, and he's like, "This is bigger than what he can deal with. You have to go and see a specialist." A thoracic specialist. So. We then went to see a, th- a thoracic doctor, and he's got to go through the testing, yeah. etc. So you're doing all that, and he's going, "Okay, well, we have to monitor it. Here's a peak flow meter," and I was seeing him every week. Every week. So a peak flow meter for those that don't know, it's what measures your lung capacity. Your lung capacity. Like when you sort of breathe out as fast and as hard as you can mm. into this device. Into this yeah. device. Yeah. So at this stage, Mike was blowing ninety. So for his height and weight, should have um, been, should have been 600. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike was blind 90 at his best, and they were like, this is really bad. When I first started, it wasn't at 90, but it actually was dropping and dropping, dropping and dropping and, and dropping. Right. It was yeah. constantly dropping. Every week I'd yeah. go in there, and it was worse. It, was, it had gone from, I, I can't remember, but 100 and something. Yeah. It had dropped down. Yeah, when we first saw him, he, he turned around and he said, uh, do you smoke? And I said, well, yeah, I used to, but at 15. And I finished at 18. And then he goes, oh, okay. And, and how much I used to smoke. Then he goes, do you drink? And I said, no, but I used to drink a bottle of scotch a night. And he goes, when that start? And I said, about 15. And he goes, finish at about 18. And he goes, okay. And he goes, is there anything else I should know? And I said, yeah, I was a drug user. And he goes, when did that start? And he goes, don't tell me. <laughs> because 15 and 18 and I said yeah that's right and he looked at Liz and said you've had a remarkable influence on this man to which her reply was no God did yeah. mm-hmm. because of course we hadn't met yeah, at this point of time yeah. but, but the Lord had, had taken away yeah. all of that from me yeah. so uh, yeah we went through doing what he wanted to do and, and the peak flow was just dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and um he, uh, he said, if we can't figure out what's wrong, I can only give you 12 weeks. Your heart's going to pack it in. And he said, I do not understand how you are. He, he said, what do you do as a job? And I said, well, because this is the first time we started talking about what I did as an occupation. And he said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I work in air conditioning, big buildings. I said, I carry a 20 kilo gas bottle up and down stairs. I've got a tool bag on my back. I've got gauges I've got you know and he looks at me and goes it's amazing you can walk he goes you should be up in a bed on an oxygen mask wow. he goes you shouldn't be walking at all and I just said oh well there for the grace of God go I yeah. you know because for me this is this is how I do it this is normal yeah. and uh, he goes well I'm going to have to send you to a um, dermatologist specialist on um, allergies he says we're going to have to get you tested and he said what I want you to do is I want you to go to your work he goes, and I want you to get a sample of the dust that's in the filtration systems. So we uh, we made the appointment. All the time, my lung function is dropping, yeah. and we go to we finally get to go to see the the guy that does the allergies. I found that I was allergic to absolutely everything from um, all the grains, everything: cats, dogs, mice, cockroaches, the lot. Everything that he put on my arms, I was allergic to, except for water, which is the test. And that's because my immune system was shot. Yeah, it was, it was my immune system just couldn't cope anymore. And then he says, "Have you got any of that stuff that you work in?" And I said, "Yeah, here you go." And he goes, "Well, this is a test." He goes, "We're going to mix this up in a solution, and we're going to put it in your eye." And he goes, um, "You may feel some itchiness. Don't scratch it." He goes, "We'll put an antihistamine in afterwards to clear it up." Oh, well, okay, no worries. He put it in my eye. <laughs> And, and, and here's Liz and the oh, doctor wow. laughing their heads off at me. So he'd no longer put a drop in my eye. They started laughing mm. because my eye had gone the size of a tomato and the same colour. 
They're just swirling. He goes, I haven't seen a reaction like this. Ever. He, ever. Like, <laughs> ever. Like, wow. It's just wow. amazing. And so, but he said, then that's a good indication of how. Of my lungs. Of Mike's lungs. Because we can't actually see them, you yeah. know, externally. Um, that's what's actually happening internally. So that's um, led on to leading that Mike is highly allergic to dust mites yeah, right. and to the dust. And his work, he was literally allergic to work. I was allergic yeah. to work. Yeah. So that's, that's a rough one to deal with, isn't it? From then on, I was told, you can't do this, you can't do that. He, he put me on a whole regime of stuff. I couldn't go into my van. I couldn't yeah. touch my tools. I couldn't touch my work clothes. Yeah. It, because you have to stay away from it. Yeah, we did it for two weeks. And my lung function tripled. Oh, yeah, tripled. It increased okay. a lot. And at this stage, all Mike's small airways had closed. closed up. Now you get a balloon, you blow it up, yeah. and you squeeze it closed, yeah. and you it's blow it up, up, and you squeeze it closed. You get to a stage where you can't blow any yeah. air back in. That was my small airways. Yeah. were well, like that balloon. They were yeah. just so... Anyway, so um, all the time we were praying about it. Mm. You know, it's not a case of just going... And, and I don't mean a five-minute prayer. Yeah. Mm. yeah five-minute prayer, five-minute answer. Yeah. Now, we were praying about it. We were fasting about it. We were really seeking the Lord about it. And my lung function just kept going up and up and up and up. And I said to the doctor, you know, this is near the end, I said, when can I stop taking the medication? And he said, when you plateau, because your lung function will plateau. And I went, um, okay, well, fair enough, no worries. But it kept going up and up and up and up. And he goes, oh, your small airways are opening up. He goes, that shouldn't happen. He goes, you should reach a certain point, and that's as far as you're going to get. That's as good as you're going to get. Oh, so, you, so his expectation being on the medication, et cetera, is that you would get back to a level. A level, that, and that would be it. That's better than where you were, yeah. but not, not that. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. But still not crash hot. Yeah. But, um, yeah, they just in, went up and up and up and up. started going up. And in the end, I just stopped. I stopped the medication. I said, yeah. Doc, I'm not, just not taking it. Yeah. And he basically turned around and says, oh, look, I don't want to see you anymore. Yeah. He goes, just, you're good. But that started a whole other train reaction with um, insurance companies. Seven years of... Eight years. Eight years of eight heartache, years. pain. Yeah. And, and all the way along that, it was Lord sought out the insurance company because they're just playing, they're being horrible, yeah. you know, with letters and stuff like that Lord please fix this up and it just got worse and worse and worse and worse you know and then I don't want to go to court Lord and we ended up in court I don't want to lose and we lost the court, the court case and we had to appeal it yeah. but you have to find an error in, in, law. in law to do that yeah. you can't just go well, I don't agree with the judge mm-hmm. yeah. our, the, our lawyers they turned around and said that's not right this is not right and they said that and like, we were just in a state. Well, I, well, I was. I was speaking yeah. for myself. I was just in. I was. I was actually totally, nearly shattered by it. Um, he turned around and says, "I'm taking this back now to our firm, and we are going to go through this with a fine tooth comb." And he goes, "Because this is wrong." And um, like you said, you can't appeal just because you don't agree with it. It's got to be on a yeah. on all error part, of error of law. So we went home. Um, I think Pastor Bob, Pastor Beverly, and Pastor Michael. Michael came over, and we just Pray hugged. We just hugged because I was in no state, yeah. you know. Yeah. And he, they prayed with us, and within half an hour, the um, the phone rang. The phone rang. It was the lawyers. And they'd found an error, in and they said we found an error, and we're going to appeal it. And I said I can't afford it. And they said we'll pay. The lawyer said we will pay. Don't you yeah. worry about it. So, and yeah, of course the Lord saw us through. Yeah, yeah. But again, that's another story. Uh, he's uh, he's absolutely amazing to mm. get us through the toughest times. That mm. and I, and I really I really do not understand how people in this world mm. can no, go through it because a lot of those things happen to other people. Mm. How do they go through life with without the faith, mm. without the healing, without the provision, without all those little small miracles? Mm. Along the way? Well, our lawyer actually said to us, "We'd be divorced." <laughs> Your your marriage will not last. last. Yeah. It's not going to last. Yeah. Uh, and because we had both been married previously, yeah. he said it's just not going to yeah. last. And because I, of the stress. Because yes. of the stress the, of everything that goes trouble. through the yeah. court yeah, case the and case, everything. Yeah. And I just said to him, well, I believe my marriage is based on more than money yeah. and, and a case. Like, yeah. you know, there is more to our marriage than that. And I know that God is going to see us through. And, you know, so all the obstacles that were put up against us, you know, you know, the walls of Jericho, they did come tumbling down. Yeah. And, and that was but for the grace of grace God. Grace of God, mm. yeah. You know. Well, you certainly have gone through a few things, you two, haven't you? Mm. Yeah. 
Can I share a scripture with you? Absolutely. We were sharing this in one of the workshops we were having with youngies uh, earlier today. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 6 and verse 31, which says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, and what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows mm. that you have need mm. yeah. uh, of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things mm. will be added unto you. That's a real piece around perspective, isn't it? Mm. It is. Mm. About, you know, when you're in the problem yeah. and the problem is so massive that you've got to take yourself out of that and seek him yeah. Yeah. and have that recognition that he knows. Mm. And we've just got to get on the set. Yeah. And then comes the trust. Mm. Well, thanks heaps for sharing Good. your testimony. Going to finish this up because I'm yeah. freezing You're now. Freezing. The sun's yeah, gone the sun down, down and I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Of course. Thank Thanks. If life is tough for you, if you're dealing with sickness and stress, uncertainty, financial woes, loneliness, in fact, it actually doesn't matter what this life is throwing at you, God's got an answer for you. Visit therevivalfellowship.com to find one of our fellowships near you or send me an email podcast at revivalontheairtoday.com. Until our next episode, God bless.